Welcome to Daryl's Beekeeping Videos. I'm a master beekeeper and tonight's project is on how to build a full-size snail grove board. Snail grove board has a lot of uses. The two most common uses that the snail grove board is used for is for swarm prevention and also you can use it to uh, put a weak colony on top of a strong colony and use the heat from the, the bottom strong colony to come up through these two screens and provide warmth through the weaker colony uh, so that way you don't have to combine colonies although that is a, a practice as well but this way you can have still maintain two colonies uh, and again the, the stronger colony is providing warmth to the weaker colony and what it consists of a, snail, a full snail grow board consists and it's also called a double screen board consists of a one eighth inch mesh screen on either side of a board and Snellgrove said that you can use uh, one half inch or larger dimension uh, plywood. In this case, I have three quarters inch simply because that's uh, what I have spare of uh, in my shop. So it works just fine. And then a full Snellgrove board will also have six gates that you can use to various combinations. In his book about swarming, his, uh, he invented the snow grow board in 1934 and he wrote his book, I think uh, 30, 1934, 1935, if I remember correctly. Um, the book's dated 1935 uh, from Britain. But um, anyway, um, it consists of six gates and in his um, book, he tells you about how to use it, whether uh, for swarm prevention uh, and he talks about method one, method two, method one, if you, um, have found the uh, the queen uh, and no queen cells, um, swarm cells, and then method two is if you have found swarm cells. Again, it's an elaborate process of using the various uh, gates. Uh, again, it's a great little book, and uh, I'll have the uh, ISBN to it um, in my video if I remember to put it there. So I hope you enjoy the video, and let's get started. Okay, I'm now at my workshop. It's an outside snow converted uh, siding collection barn uh, that I've converted to make my beekeep equipment. It's about 45 degrees. It's in January. It's a great time to make equipment uh, getting ready for the upcoming season. So what I'm making today, um, as I stated earlier, is I'm making uh, snail grove boards, both the snail grove board and the modified snail grove board, which the modified version just does not have the six gates um, that I fully intend to use in my apiary operations this year. So I'm going to show you this piece first and then I'm going to take you in and show you actually how I cut the pieces for it and make the equipment. Uh, but what I want to show you here is if you're working by yourself it's a lot of times it's really hard to uh, maneuver a full sheet of plywood. So the easiest way for a single person to maneuver a full sheet of uh, plywood is when you go to Lowe's or Home Depot where I get mine. Uh, ask them to make uh, three cuts in your plywood. They'll do it for, they usually do one cut for free, they say, and they'll charge you 50 cents for each additional cut, but every time I've done it, they've done all three cuts for free. Um, so, like I said, I get a full four by eight sheet of plywood. Um, this is just a three quarter inch uh, sheeting plywood. And then from there, I ask them to cut it into two foot sections. That way, it makes it much easier to maneuver on my table saw or my job site saw. Um, by myself. So I just want to show you this and it, with each one of these uh, two foot sections I can get three snail grove boards. Um, so if you do the math three times four sections uh, I can get 12 snail grove boards out of one sheet of plywood. By having uh, Lowe's cut it into three sections you do get a little bit of waste uh, but it's not enough to worry about it. Uh, if you were to buy a snail grove board from your local beef store they're going to cost you about $26, $25 for each snow grove board. And by using, making it out of three quarter inch plywood and uh, some one by material, you can make it for less than $3. Uh, so again, I just want to show you this piece. Now I'm going to reset the camera and show you how I set up and make the cuts. Okay, so now I'm out in my shop itself. And so the way I do it, uh, make my cuts is I don't have to do a whole lot of measuring the way I do it. Um, because I let the, I use the measurements off an actual piece of gear whenever possible. Uh, I will have to do a few measurements 
for the snail grow board simply to align the holes, um, but it's really simple. So the first thing I do is I grab my wood, in this case it's three-quarter plywood, so um, I'd already pre-measured it, but basically the same thickness as a regular piece of one by material, and I just raise the blade uh, just a little bit above the wood. Um, and one caveat to this before I, ever, before I get into it, um, it's important that you uh, know how to tune up your uh, equipment to make sure it's making a straight cut. And also you should look on YouTube and other videos uh, from somebody else that knows a, a lot about power tools and make sure you know uh, what a kickback looks like and how to avoid it. So when I'm making my cuts today, I'm going to be controlling uh, the working piece is going to be up against my guide fence. I'm going to be controlling that piece. I'm going to be paying attention to where that blade is spinning at all times. Uh, so keep that in mind. And also have uh, the safety pieces in, installed in mind today. I have the riving blade on the back side of my saw blade. You probably can't see it in the camera that far away. But what that does is as I'm pushing the wood through, the wood doesn't come back together and create a potential kickback situation and come back on me. Um, so like I said, make sure you review all safety uh, precautions. And when I actually do the cuts, you'll see that I'm going to have eye protection on. I'm going to have ear, ear protection in to protect my ears. Uh, and again, I don't have any loose gloves or anything on or loose equipment that can get caught in that spinning blade. So again, make sure you look at your videos uh, from somebody who uh, does a lot of woodworking. Uh, this is just my technique of how to do it. Again, you assume your own risk whenever you do your own building. So again, the first thing I want to do is I want to raise this um, blade up. And on my particular saw, I have I made a zero clearance insert. And you can buy these um, off the internet. Um, and then there's, again, there are videos on how to actually make this narrow cut in here. Um, so it really cuts down on the chances of wood falling down in here. And it also helps reduce the risk of a kickback as well. Um, because again, it's very, there's no clearance on either side of this other than uh, just a blade. Um, so like I said, the first thing I do is I raise the blade up so it's just a little bit above the wood. Uh, so that way when I push it forward, I'm not having a big blade spinning at me. It's just a very little bit. Again, I'm going to watch where my hands are. Um, if I were working with smaller pieces, I would use a push stick. In this case, it's plywood. So I've got to use both hands to control it. Um, to, again, to keep a thick kick rack. So the way I set this up, I first set my blade up. The next thing I do is um, I grab the piece of care that I'm going to use. In this case, it's an eight frame box. And if you're using a 10 frame box, again, you can get three of those snail grove boards uh, the same way. So in this case, uh, a snail grove board is going to fit the exact outside dimensions of the box. So I just simply set the box up and then I move my fence till uh, it touches the box and the box pushes up against the blade to where it just barely touches the blade. Uh, and it should run freely back and forth as you go and there shouldn't be a gap as you go, as you push it through. So that's how I get the width. If you do this, this technique is how I do it and I get a perfect cut every time. Um, if it, and if it somehow gets a little bit off, which is extremely rare that it does, the bees don't care. Uh, so this is how I do it. So I make uh, the cut like that. Um, and then I'll just toss the excess wood when I'm done. Uh, so I'm gonna make the first cut. I'm gonna set up and make the first cut. Okay, so now I've got my uh, protective earplugs in and my eye protection in. Again, if I thought my hat was gonna fall off, I'd probably take that off too. In this case, it's not. Uh, so I'm pulling the wood back well away from the blade. I'm gonna start up my saw. I'm gonna push through it. Um, I'll try to cut this part of the audio out so you're not hearing the blade spin. Uh, so I'm going to make these three cuts, and then I'm going to shut off the video, and I'm going to grab my other board. I'm going to make a total of six of these snail grove boards today. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to start it up. Again, watching where that blade is at all times.
Okay, so now you saw uh, how quick and easy it is. So one point of emphasis as I was pushing it through, this because this board was between the blade and the fence, that's where the potential for kickback is. So I was pushing down and in with my control hand as I was pushing it through, and I'm pushing it, holding it uh, down here, and I'm pushing it uh, with my left hand, but mostly just keeping this piece uh, control from warping on me. Never, ever, ever push against the wood once you get to the middle part of the blade or, or more. Preferably, you, you don't do it uh, for the blade. Again, so because what happens if you get on the back side of the blade and you're pushing in on the outside piece, you could actually cause it to tip in and then kick back on you. So never, ever, ever push against the outside of the board and go beyond the middle part of the blade. Preferably, I was told by carpenters that you don't actually go uh, further than the front edge of the, the board as well. But again, you're making the majority of your control with this uh, part that's in here. Again, if I had a smaller piece of wood, I would actually have one of these pusher sticks. And again, it pushes down, and I'm using a pusher stick on the opposite side to push against the wood until it got to the blade. Um, and again, just keep the wood from popping up and it's holding it up against the fence. So again, point of emphasis on that. Um, I'm going to shut the video down. I'm going to go cut these other three boards. This is now scrap. I could set this inside. If I thought I could use it for anything else, I could uh, just save it. In this case, it's, it's scrap. I don't have any other use for it, so I'm going to toss it in my scrap barrel. Okay, so I've now set my saw up uh, for the other cut. You'll see it. I'm going to show you how I actually set that up. So so all I did was I cut with that first cut. So all I did was cut for the uh, one side of the board. Now, as you can see, I put the plywood up on top of my eight frame box just to show you that you still have to do another cut uh, just to get it the, the proper length. So again, just showing, I've got it here just to show you the over length. So I just got my boards off to the side. So the way I set this up, like I said, is I've got my table saw set up and the power's off right now. Uh, blade's not turning. So I just simply line up the center of my box with the center of this uh, blade and then I simply take and I move my fence with the box until it just lightly touches that blade and then from there I go ahead and lock in my um, fence and then I just simply as in when I push it back and forth you'll see that I just I do a test I always do a test run first to make sure that I'm not getting any binding if I'm getting any binding then something's not right. Um, so I need to check. Oh, I know what it was. My box is dragging on the back side of my, uh, of my saw blade, That's, or my table saw. So again, I just make sure it, I've got a smooth run through there and nothing's binding. Again, it should just lightly touch the blade and not spin it. Um, one thing about this DeWalt saw, if you get uh, too far over uh, and you get too much of a gap, it does have this little fence where I can actually uh, rest it on that as well. Um, so it doesn't move. Um, that could have been also what was going on. Again, I'm not a carpenter by trade, uh, but again, you can see how easily it runs smoothly up against it. All right, everything's running fine. Nothing's binding. So I'm gonna set this aside. And now I'm gonna grab my wood. Again, pay attention which side you've cut. Again, you can see how I've cut the long axis with the blade before. Now I'm gonna cut this other piece off. Uh, again, pay attention which side of wood you want to waste. In this case, I've got a nice little divot in this wood, so I'm going to cut this in. That's going to be scrap wood. Again, same thing here. I'm going to control this with my hand, and I'm going to make sure that uh, my hand does not get beyond, definitely not beyond the center of the blade. Um, and then whenever I take the wood away, I'm pushing it off the side, and preferably you turn the saw blade off. Uh, push it all the way through. Again, watching where that spinning blade is at all times.
All right, so I let the saw blade come to a complete stop. Um, from there, I'm going to simply take my blade down, and I'm done with my table saw. Because the rest of all that's all I have to do now. I take it back. I do have to make some. I have to do make the uh, the um, rails for it. Uh, so again, I'm done with that piece. I'm going to shut the camera off while I set up for the rails, um, and we'll go from there. Okay, so now I'm ready to make the raised portions of the snow grove, modified snow grove board, and also the snow grove, the actual snow grove board. Um, so the first thing I did is I'm going to raise up my blade. To this is the stock I'm going to cut my 3 8 inch uh, pieces from. So again, this is just nothing but scrap one by material that I have, um, and I can get several pieces out of this. Um, so in this case, I just set it next to the blade, and then I raise the blade until it's just barely above the wood, about the where the tooth is, coming above the blade. And then, so that's set that aside. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a uh, <coughs> metal rule or tape measure, whatever you happen to have. This just comes off a off of a square that I have. Um, and now I'm going to set the fence to 3 8 inch. So again, this is a rip cut. Um, so again, I'm going off the inside edge. Um, so as I slide my fence over, so I get my 3 8 inch. And that looks about right. Lock it in. And then from there, um, if your um, guide doesn't fit through here, you can make a smaller one. In this case, what I did, I just made a smaller one. Again, I'm not a carpenter, so assume your own risk when you make it. This is just how I do it. You assume your own risk uh, whenever you make your own parts. This is just how I do it. Um, so as I do it, I've got my roller stand set up. So as I'm going to feed up my long stock, I'm pushing it through. Again, because the, the piece that I'm cutting is between the blade and the fence, that's the part that I'm controlling with downward motion and um, letting it, again, be in control because um, that's what's going to kick back on me. Uh, I'm not worried about the outside piece as much. Again, I'm going to push in on it before it hits the blade uh, on this side of the blade. I never go beyond the blade, uh, the center of the blade, and preferably never the, go into the blade itself. But again, you definitely do not because, again, it could pinch and then kick back. So that's all I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be pushing down on it here and just kind of letting it push through. I'm going to feed it through my, with my hand until it gets kind of close. And I'm going to pick up this smaller guide stick and push down and through it. Um, and once it clears the blade, then I'm going to stop the saw, let it come to a complete stop, and then I can run the next one until I get enough. And then I'll take it over to my compound miter saw and then cut the lengths that I need. All right. So getting set. All right. So I got my push stick ready. Everything's set. Okay, um, again, if I leave the audio on when I actually do the final edit of this, um, you would actually hear the, the blade uh, bogging down. And what was happening, because this board um, is old, or what, for whatever reason, it wanted, as it was going through, it was trying to naturally curve, curl back in itself. That's why this riving blade 
that comes on these saws now, it's why it's important that you leave that thing on because what can happen is that as it curves in and you don't have that riding blade, it can hit it that front of that blade and kick back on you. Um, so again, as I got closer, I was making sure again, pushing down and in, but this pusher stick never went beyond the ed front edge of this blade. Uh, and I tried to not even get at that, but again, uh, I tried to keep it outside of the blade. So again, applying pressure against the fence and then pushing in um, with this pusher stick. And again, so you can see I've got a nice long piece to work with. These are all three, three eighths inch uh, long. And I'll make a, uh, a few more of these um, and I'll go on with it from there. So I'm gonna turn off the video as you saw how that worked. All right, so now I'm ready to cut my gates for my snow grow board. Remember early, previously I cut out these three quarter, or excuse me, three eighths inch tall um, side rails that we could use all the way around. Um, so then again, I don't like to do a lot of um, measuring. So what I do is I like to create templates. So that's all I do is I cut out a three inch piece of material that I want to use for my gate. So you can see it has uh, parallel cuts on it. They're cut at 45 degrees. It makes it easy to set up the sliding compound miter saw. Uh, and then also when I made my template, I determined the center line, uh, which is again at the one, I, one and a half inches from either end of this gate. And then I marked the dead center of it from the width of it. So that way whenever I got ready to put my screw in it, I can do that. Um, you'll see that step in a little while. But again, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to make, I need six of these for the uh, snow grow board. So again, so all I do is I line it up on my previous piece and then I flush, make sure the ends are flush. And then I grab my pen. I like using pens because it's a consistent thickness off the uh, wood. You can also use a pencil, but remember the pencil width is gonna diminish a little bit and you won't get as accurate a cut in my opinion. Again, I'm not a carpenter. So you can see I made my cut. And then it's all I have to do is put it on my saw Put my template aside. I like this sliding compound miter saw from DeWalt. It has the light. I turn it on, the light comes, shines down on either side of the blade and then creates a shadow of the blade so I know exactly where that cut is. So now because my good piece is to the right, I want my cut to the left. And again, I'm keeping my fingers clear of that area at, at all times. All right, I see that my line is on the outside of my mark and I can do my cut. Make sure my fingers are clear. And let the blade come to a stop. And then from there, I can take the piece I just cut and then just compare it against the other piece that I just had. And if it's not flush, I can make another cut on it just to make sure. Um, in this case, it's fine. So I will make, again, at least six of these. Um, I'll probably make an extra two just in case I split a piece of wood. Um, it's always good to have, so uh, on to the next step. Okay, so now what I'm doing, I'm in the design process where, again, this is a full-size snail grow board. So in my design, I decided that I am going to make um, a three and a half inch border all the way around uh, for my holes. And eventually, once I get the holes cut out much like this, this will then become my template. So it's all I have to do in the future instead of measuring everything out, so all I have to do is come in and trace my holes uh, on my board and I'm set. It's, it'll be that much faster. Uh, so, so, so all I've done is uh, on my board is I've simply uh, measured out the center marks of the board. Um, if you watched my video on a modified snow grow board, I already had a center lines marked off. Uh, so that's all it is, I transferred them. And again, if you didn't have it, you just take a metal rule um, and then measure it out to the center of the board, draw your line, do the same thing for the other axis, draw your center line, and then because in my design, I'm gonna have a two inch solid piece uh, supporting the center. Remember, Snellgrove said it's all you need is a three and a half inch uh, diameter hole or larger it will work for uh, the swarming board, Snellgrove board that he designed. Um, so that's how I'm designing it. So that's all I did from there is I measured off an inch of either of, uh, of the center line. Um, that becomes that solid piece that you just saw. And to keep myself from inadvertently cutting that out, as I'm just gonna, because this will eventually become my template. 
So all I do is I put an X through that centerpiece just to let me know not to cut it out. Again, use a pencil, pen, wherever you have. So now I know not to cut that out. And again, I came out and measured three and a half inches from all the corners, transferred those lines onto my board, and then uh, now I need to mark where I'm gonna drill my holes for my jigsaw to fit through. So that's all I did is I see my corners and I've got a mark in the corners to let me know where to drill those eight holes so that uh, I can fit my jigsaw in. So now I will show you that. I just simply made sure that my drill bit is larger than the uh, larger diameter than my jigsaw blade. And then I'm just working on a piece of a supporting piece here that I can drill through. And I'm just going to drill those eight holes. And my board's splintering a little bit. Not a big deal. Bees don't care. Alright, so you can see that I now have my eight holes drilled. Uh, so now so all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my jigsaw and I'm just going to free cut those holes. Again, because I'm going to overlap the holes that I've cut out, I'm going to overlap those about an inch with my 1 8 inch mesh screen. So there's um, plenty of room. I don't have to worry. It's not an exact. Uh, again, you're not building carpentry so or cabinetry, so it doesn't have to be exact. So here we go. Again, by my X, it reminded me not to cut any further. Um, And there's my first hole. Flip it around, and I'll do the same for this side. And that's all there is to it, to making these holes. Um, again, I'll just clean up the wood on the back side a little bit, so don't uh, nail my hands whenever I get ready to uh, put the mesh on. Um, so again, so that's all I would have to do in the future, is like I showed you momentarily ago, as I would just take a blank board that's cut to size, I just lay my template on top of it, and then from there I can take my pencil and trace inside that, drill my four, uh, my eight holes in my next board, and it'll go really quick uh, for all the ones after this. Uh, so again, this will now become my template. I'll end up making uh, using one of these for, since this is now a template, I'll use uh, one of these as my uh, actual snail road board for today. Uh, so on to the next step, I'll get set up for that. Um, and so all we're going to do is start making the, the side rails for it. Okay, I've now moved inside. It's getting dark. Um, again, as I'm building this thing, um, so that's all I did was I figured out my, confirmed my exact center uh, of my cross lines um, so that I can make my, start making my side rails. So then, remember I cut these uh, gates out earlier, and again, it's critical um, to a degree that 
these pieces are exact same length. If not, you can custom, custom fit them, uh, which is probably what I'll end up just verifying. But in theory, if I've determined my exact center on each axis, I should be able to make identical cuts. For Remember, these are going to be top and bottom pieces. Uh, left and right so of this gate so the this gate is a crucial piece to get figured out first so I determined my exact fit from there um, I marked out my lines I'm going to put the in boards on first remember the front of the snow grow board uh, is a solid piece so that doesn't have a gate um, so, so all I did was in my test run um, was I simply took my uh, gate and I marked the center lines of it from there, I simply took it um, and used one of these um, countersink bits. In this case, I got it from Lowe's. It's Cobalt brand. It comes in a pack of four. They were fairly inexpensive. I can't remember how much they were. Um, for this, because I'm using three quarters inch wood as my base wood and then three eighths inch uh, rails, I ended up needing one inch uh, number eight screws. Um, if you're using a half inch plywood, then you can get away with three quarters inch long number eight screws. Um, in this case, um, I used the, because I've got the three quarters, I used the one inch. And then uh, just to make sure that, again, test run for the countersink, just to see how far it is on this bevel. So all I did is I did a test shot uh, in through my mark, and I went into it, drilled it into a scrap piece of wood. And then from there, I went and screwed it in just to make sure that it wasn't protruding all the way through my board. If it protruded all the way through this, I'd know it would go all the way through the board. In this case, it was perfect. I still was able to move the gate freely. Um, so from there, I can actually just toss all this aside now. Now that I have my pilot hole in my template, I can simply take my next piece, and I've already done it on a couple of these, I can simply take my template, line it up so that the edges are flush on all pieces of my underlying piece. And if you wanted to uh, keep them drilled into your piece, just make sure you can still use your scrap wood on top of it just as a, a base. Again, so I'm making sure that everything's flush all the way around. And then from there, I can take my bit, run it through, and it will give me a hole mark on my bottom. And then from there, I can simply drill it all the way through. And now I've got um, my next piece already done. Again, I will need a total of six of these. So that was three. Just line it up. And then whenever I get my, ready to put my gate in, I'll just line everything up and then screw it straight through. All right, got my mark. Drill it all the way through. That's four. Line it up, blowing up the dust out of my hole uh, there. So again, coming in, drill it in. Got my pilot hole. That's five. Line up flush on the ends. Come through. Got my hole started. That's six. And again, I like to have an extra one just in case I split one. Line it up. Everything's flush. Start my hole. I don't have to go all the way down to the countersink. So all I'm doing is identifying where the hole is. This one I countersink. And again, this is where I'm drilling into a piece of scrap wood. So I'm not going into my piece underneath. And I now have all of them set. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to establish this front line of my um, snow grove board. So in this case, since that would be the front, so all I have to do, again, I don't like to measure, but you can if you want to. So that's all I do. I'm going to flip it around so I can see it a little easier. Is I'm just simple, Again, I'm creating templates. Um, so this will be used from now on. I won't have to do much measuring. So I just simply make it sure it's flush on one end. And then from there, I can take my pin and then simply come down. And then mark where it is, mark the bad side of the wood, come over to my um, saw. I'll turn the camera off and make the, you've seen the flush cut on one of the other ones.
All right, so I'm over at my um, miter saw. I just simply line it up. Um, my good side is to my left, because remember I put that X on my wood, so I'm cutting to the right, because my good piece is now to my left. I want to cut to just to the right of my mark. Make sure the shadow lines up properly. Make the cut. Once the saw comes to stop, I can uh, toss that wood in my the scrap into my scrap barrel. From there, I'll just come over and check it one final time, and it's an exact fit. It's just that easy. Uh, so from there, I can actually staple it down. So while I get set up for that, I'll turn the camera off and get set up, and I'll show you to staple it in, and we'll make the next piece. Okay, so my next step is to nail this, in this case, staple this uh, rail onto my the front of my snow grow board. So it's all I'm using is a Harbor Freight uh, Central Pneumatic 18 gauge 2 in 1 air nailer. I'll have a photo slide at the very end of my uh, presentation to show you what this looks like. This is model 63156. Harbor Freight makes really good tools, pneumatic tools, uh, for inexpensive. When I bought this, this is like $25. If you were to buy a pneumatic stapler from a major hardware store, Lowe's, Home Depot, it's probably going to cost you $150 to $200. So for $25, it's a great little nailer. I'm going to toss this to the side. Um, the way I like to do it, again, uh, if a true carpenter would probably measure it, I don't. I just eyeball it. So I take my staples, uh, just to confirm size, I've got a box of these things, a bunch of different sizes. This is uh, one inch. Um, so that's all I do is I line up, in this case, my three-eighths three inch stock that I'm going to used for my rails, uh, and then I just measure it uh, right on top of the board that I'm nailing into, make sure it goes through about half to three quarters of the way into the wood below it, um, and doesn't punch all the way through. In this case, it doesn't, so it's, it's perfect. So it's, it's uh, one inch long uh, crown staples, narrow crown staples, so the way you would load this is never, ever, ever point this tip toward your face or your body. Uh, and you always want to disconnect it when you load it. So the way that you load it is you squeeze that little button, you pull it off, and then these, on this particular staple, top load, so I would simply take my staples and then load them in, just like this, over the rail. From there, I can close it up, just like that. Again, it's always pointed away from me. From there, I'll go ahead and hook up my air supply. Again, I'll have a uh, slide that shows all my work, most of my power tools uh, that I use and all my hand tools. All right, so again, I'm connecting this away from my body. It's now connected. From there, I'm going to simply, this is now going to be the front of my snail grove board. So I'm just going to simply, I'm going to turn this around so I get a little more access to it. I'm going to simply make sure the edges are flush, and I'm going to come in about an inch from each end of the, um, rail, and I'm going to nail it at an angle uh, to the board. Again, it's flush. It's flush. Come in. I put one on that end, and I always keep my hands at least an inch away, or excuse me, at least a couple inches away from the end of this nailer, because when I've established, especially when you're doing high, uh, high bodies, uh, sometimes those staples can hit a piece of wood in there and dart out at an angle. Trust me, it hurts when it goes in your hand. Um, so if I can't hold it down a couple inches away, I'll simply hold it down as best I can and then move my hands out of the way. And then and remember this nailer has a pneumatic, or excuse me, a pressure piece plate on it you have to depress first. So I make sure it's flush. I go ahead and put my uh, nailer on there. I've got earplugs in. I nail it. Uh, and because this is the front piece, I can go ahead and nail it in the center. If it were the back piece, I couldn't do that. And I'll put a couple more in. Just like that, it's nailed in place. Again, it's nothing popped out on the sides. If it did, I would just use my um, um, long flat tip screwdriver and a hammer and use it like a nail set and place it in. So from there, I am ready to set my um, gate in place. So in this case, I'm going to put the gate where it swings out like this. Um, so I'm going to place it in. doesn't matter as long as they're all consistent. So I'm going to make sure it's flush. I'm going to put the hole that I drilled earlier, I'm going to put it online with that um, 
center mark. And if all goes well, I'm going to pre-drill a little bit into the plywood so I'm not fighting it as much. All right, I pre-drilled a little bit. From there, you could take, if you had another um, cordless drill, you could actually um, use that. I've got another one at the house I should have brought it. So I'm going to start this screw. In this case, I'm just doing it old school with just a regular screwdriver. Line it up with a hole I just piloted and screw it in. All right, so that's the first gate in place. Again, you can loosen these up a little bit if you need to. All right, again, countersuit it. If, you, if it's not countersunk enough, then you can pull that out um, and then center, uh, sink it in again. So in that case, it looks okay. From there, I'm gonna go ahead and put one on the front. And again, hopefully, I'm putting the gates facing all the same direction. So line up my mark that's on the top of my um, template that I had before. Lined up, screwed in place. And hopefully, when I get done, everything will be the exact dimensions left and right. All right, so that's in there nicely. Springs, springs well. I'll probably end up redrilling this other hole after I get done. That's not sunk deep enough as I'd like for it to be. So this one swings nice and freely. All right. So from there, I'm going to finish out this front. So again, the easiest way for that is to um, measure from my cut all the way over. All right. So from there, I'm going to simply, whew, sorry, disregard. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a 45 degree on this first, butt it up against that. There we go. Then I'm going to measure it so you'll see me go do that I'm gonna put a 45 degree on this lock my saw in place put my light on I'm gonna cut off this 45 degrees off the tip of this line it up and that's why you go into the wood slowly and that's why you wear eye protection did you see I don't know if you can see in the camera when I came down I was coming down a little too fast and it caught the tip of that and then broke it off. So I'm going to square up my wood again. Come down slow. Came down slow. Now I don't have a, a broken piece of wood. So I'm going to put my 45 degree back on it again. Locks in place. From there, I'm going to come down slowly this time. Hold it in place. In all the years I've done been doing this, you notice I let the saw complete, come completely uh, to a stop before I reached in there. Um, so now I've got my 45 degree on this, I can simply line it up with my um, gate. And then from there I can mark on the edge of the wood and make a custom piece. Alright, so I've got my wood, I'm arc the bad side. So here's my piece, the side that I want to cut. And then there's my bad side, so I know where to line it. Come back, put my saw at a 90 degrees. Come back and cut to the right of my mark, because that's the bad side. Slowly. From there, I should be flush, and it is. So if I measured properly in the center, that's all I have to do is flip this over now, and it should line up perfectly. And it does. So that means I, when I was careful to align my marks, I was able to get it exactly in the center. So now this can be my template, and I can make, oh, one, two, three, four. I can make three more of these, plus keep this one as a template, um, and I should be good to go. So I'll need to make four of these. So if you saw my earlier videos, or excuse me, other earlier just demonstration. All right, so the way I do this, again, I don't have to make a whole lot of measurements now that I've got my template set up. I just simply make my edge flush and then trace my mark. 
put my mark on the bad side. Here's my new piece that I got to cut out, and it should be the same. And I forgot to say, uh, because this is not my template, I'll mark this as a template, and I'll say back. So I know which side it goes on, and I'll put Snell Grove at some point on there. All right, so I know which piece cut out now. Set it back up to 45, lock it down, pay attention to where my mark is. Alright, so now from there I should be able to come in. Now that this is ready, I can simply make sure it's flush. I can now come in with my pneumatic stapler, come in an inch, make sure everything's flush, come in an inch, at an angle, nail, come in back an inch, nail, come back and put one in the center, and there you go. Now this gate will swing smoothly. Alright, so now I'll simply take my next piece of working wood. From there I simply trace it. Again I can just verify one more time that it does fit. It does. From there I can simply trace my pattern onto it. Mark the bad side of the wood with a little dot or an X. From there I go and cut it. This one still gets laid at a 45. All right, that's the bad side that I'm cutting. Shadows line up. All right, so from there, it should set in there perfectly. Now what I'm doing here, uh, it, I don't know if it's that obvious in the camera, but I'm basically making sure this gate is flush with the outside edge of the board. And then from there, I'm making sure that those bevels, when they line up, that they're running, that they're smooth, and everything's flush. So in this particular case, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to tack the gate side first. Again, not the actual gate. And it moved on me. All right, so everything's flush. I'll come in and nail this. All right, so now my gate can be out of the way. Not a big deal. Okay, so now I have my front board on, which is solid. I have my three gates on this side installed. Uh, they move smoothly. I have the back portions already done. The gate is running smoothly. Now it's all have. Uh, so continue. So like I said, I've got my backs on, my fronts on, um, all my gates on this side. So now it's all I have to do is measure. Um, the side piece. And the way you want to do that so that you don't get an, a, a wrong uh, length is you just simply take a piece of scrap piece uh, or the, uh, your template you used earlier and line it up. It's what I use just to kind of give it flush. And I'm going to take this uh, other piece I'm about to cut and to get an exact fit I simply place it against the gate and make sure the gate is flush with the outside edge. From there I simply line up the 45's, make sure everything is flush. That's where that template from before helps. It helps me keep everything oriented. So now the 45s are aligned. From there I can take my pin and go back to my, make sure everything's aligned and twisted. From there I can make a mark on my um, piece I'm about to cut and then uh, to line it up on the inside edge of this rail. And then from there I can simply reverse this just to make sure I've got it centered if I wanted to. I can simply flip it around and then make sure that it's flush. In this case it is because I took the time to center it. But if it wasn't, if you are if you did have a, a misalignment, it's still the same process. You just have to in, cut individual pieces. But because I was very careful on how I centered these holes um, for my gates, I can use one template now for the front, or excuse me, for the back, and one template for the sides, and I should be good to go. But if I didn't, I just cut, custom cut each piece just by putting this little... Um, template at the 45's on there, just kind of give it a, a nice uh, level spot to the rod on, line it up, make my mark, and then go over to my, call, my saw and make that uh, 
uh, 90 degree cut, which is what I'll do right now. All right, so in this case, it's a piece to the right that I want to save, and because I'll have better control with the amount of wood that's to the left, I'm going to switch it to the left. I just got to remember which side to cut now. And I come over and check it. Actually in place, fits perfectly. I'll flip it around to the other side just to make sure. And if it's not, if in this case, it's, for some reason it looked like it was on, I can simply custom adjust it whenever I get ready to cut this out, so it's not a big deal. It looks like I'm gonna be custom fitting each piece. It's not that big a deal. So from here, um, All right, so it looks like I'm custom fitting everything from now on. So um, just because it's off just a smidge, maybe a millimeter or less. Uh, so again, I'm just going to simply custom fit. So I just line everything up, flush the gates closed on this side. From there, I grab my pneumatic nailer. Again, it's kind of annoying. My uh, pneumatic uh, pancake is, is constantly going on. All right. Gate okay, still function, nothing went through it. So from there, I cut a 45 degree angle on this. Um, so now I'll just simply take a piece of scrap, line it up over, and then line it up. Line up everything flush. Make a mark on my wood. And then from there, mark the bad side, and I'll go cut the 90 degree. come back make sure it is flush it is so now I'll nail it in place hands out of the way angle nailed 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 that was in place and I'll repeat this for this side and then you didn't see it earlier but I transferred my marks from this side over to this side, so all I used was my uh, square, and I simply transferred the lines over, and then that's how I'll install the gates like you saw before. So I'll skip through the rest of the video um, to where I, I'll, I'll finish doing this, and then I'll show you installing the screen. Okay, so now we're on to our next last final step. Um, prior to, um, just as soon as I got done uh, putting the gates on, um, what I did then is I made myself some latches to put on this. And if you had screw eyes, which I had, I don't know where they went. So I just used some of these spare um, number eight screws. I just pre-drilled them. So I just centered it, put them centered on the hole. And what that does is it gives me a little lever to open the gates. Um, one of the things I also um, didn't tell you is when I initially put these gates on, as I was getting ready to custom cut each part, I took my screwdriver and screwed this down tight so that this state didn't move while I was measuring these other pieces. After I connected all the parts, the left and right of it, um, the rails, I simply loosened the screw back up so this gate opens nice and smooth. And like I said, after I totally got done putting on all my rails, I simply put one of these screws in the side, just to give me a spot to open the gates. Just an easy way to put the gates open. Um, one of the other things I want to mention is I cannot stress safety enough. Uh, I did everything right a little bit ago. It was off camera uh, when, I was, when I was cutting some of these other 45s. And it was actually, 45 was actually in the middle of the wood. Uh, and I was coming down slow. And for whatever reason, it came, a chunk came flying off and actually hit me in my safety glasses. So I can't stress enough to wear safety goggles and earplugs. Because uh, this probably just saved my light or saved my eyesight tonight when this chunk flew up and got me in the hit me on this lens. Um, so do use all your safety precautions um, at all times. Like I said, I was doing everything right, and this thing still caught for whatever reason and flare, and shot up and got me. Um, but like I said, didn't do any damage because I was wearing my safety goggles. Not a big deal. So the next thing I want to do is I need to cut two pieces of screen to fit one on either side of this. 
uh, snail grow board and staple it down and then I'll be done with the project. So I just simply took my measuring stick and I want to put an inch on either side and more importantly um, since I'm using these gates I open up all these gates to where the tip is putting in and I want to make sure that my gate is not going to come anywhere near those this mesh so it doesn't get snagged hung up on it. So um, in this case I just backed off. Ideally, ideally I want an inch on either side just give me some some flex room in case this wire's twisted a little bit, um, angle a little bit. Um, so I just give myself, in this case, I figured out it is um, eight and a half by 15 when I did it this way. So I'll measure off. So all I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna set this aside for a second. And I'm gonna measure off eight and a half by 15 on my, uh, this is one eighth inch mesh hardware cloth. You can get it at your uh, local hardware store. If they don't carry it in stock, they can order it for you. Uh, I think a roll like this uh, was probably about $150, $100 to $150 when I got it. Maybe, like I said, I think it's closer to $150. Um, you'll use a lot, uh, and don't, when you get done with all the pieces, when I'm going to mark this off and cut it off, don't throw away your scraps because you'll find you'll use most of it. Uh, when you make your own equipment, there's very little goes to waste. Um, so if I'm making ventilation boards or ventilation boxes, I'll take these scrap pieces and then overlap those little holes that I'm going to drill in my uh, ventilation boxes. And, and that'll be a project for a different video. All right, so eight and a half by 15. So what I like to do is I like to use a scripto marker, Sharpie pen, and then I'll simply lay out my roll and I'll measure it in about four different places and I'll use this metal rule stick. So eight and a half and then by 15 that way. So eight and a half. Put my mark. I'll come down a little bit more, eight and a half. And I constantly repeat my measurements to myself. I'm just going right off the edge. Eight and a half. Eight and a half. Again, just to repeat myself to make sure I've got it. And then from there, I simply line up my marks wherever they are. Again, double check the measurement. That one looked a little bit off, but not. Nope. It's just because the wire's angled a little bit, like I said, um, for whatever reason. Not a big deal. So from there, I'll hold my thing. Now all my marks line up now. Whoops. And it slid off <laughs> just as soon as I said that. All right, so let's try this again. Gremlins are only hard tonight. All right, so mark it. Mark it. Get rid of my mark off my marker. All right, so from there, I've got my black mark. I don't know how well it shows up on the camera. I like these uh, WISS, W-I-S-S, all-purpose scissors. Um, they're like shears. Um, if you've got uh, tin snips or shears, you can use those. These are, uh, I got these off of Amazon. They're inexpensive, um, and they cut through, right through this. Uh, one eighth inch mesh and you'll see that here in a second as I go at this point if you wanted to use gloves to protect your hands from this wire That'd be a good time to get that All right, so I need two of these and just for giggles um, What I like to do is I like to once I get it cut out my first piece, I like throwing it on top of it, my piece, just to make sure that I did cut it right. And I'm not cutting too bad pieces and, uh, if I cut it wrong. So in this case, it overlaps just fine. So I'll set it down. And then I'll measure again and then cut my second piece of wire because that's not going to be long enough. Eight and a half. Mark. 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 Line it up. Line it up. 
And for whatever reason, this mark was off a little bit. So I'm going to verify it. Measure, measure, add each, measure twice. Cut once. It's eight and a half. Yeah, this one's off just a smidge. So I'll redo that one. Nope, that one's on. Just looked weird, I guess. Huh. All right. Again, it's not... You're not making carpentry, so it can be a little bit off. That's why you give yourself plenty of fledge factor. All right. So from there, I'll set my ruler aside so I don't bend it. Set my marker aside. And now I'll cut. And then I'm just going to tie my roll back up before I forget. And so it doesn't go flying all over the place. Let's take some bailing string. Tie it up. Put a little bow on it. Make it look all pretty. And I can set it aside. I'll clean that up a little later. Alright, so that's eight and a half. And then I got to measure off 15. Fifteen. And then what I like to do is I like to put an X on the bad side. Fifteen. Fifteen. Line it up. My mark across all the way across and you should be able to see that X I'll just make it a little more pronounced hopefully you can see the X in the camera that's just my bad side I'll get ready to cut that here in a second I'll do the same thing on this one and you can see this wire when you get it it's angled a little bit just because of just the way that it's rolled um, again it's not that big a deal um, your bees don't care if it's angled all right so 15 now, if I was a commercial um, beekeeper and I was selling this stuff, then I might make it a little bit more pretty, but my bees don't care. I don't care. It's functional. Just not a nice 90 degree angle that you're used to seeing when you buy commercial equipment. All right, so I got my marks, put my X on my bad side. Just making sure that I marked the right side. I did. All right, so X is to my right. So now I'm just going to cut this. Toss that to the side. Again, save that. You can use it for other stuff. Here's my other one. X is to the right, so that's my bad side. Toss it to the side. Now what I'm going to do is... Pull my snail grove board up, and then I'm going to put these screens, I'm going to center it. Again, because I'm using the gates, uh, I'm going to open the gates up just to make sure that I have adequate clearance between them. And then from there, I switch to my other pneumatic nailer. And this is a, again, from Harbor Freight, Central Pneumatic, 20 gauge wide crown stapler. It comes, uh, you get these little wide crown uh, staples for it. And you can see what they look like. So with this one, again, I'll have pictures, a slide, a couple slides with all my tools. Um, with this one, it opens from the bottom. Again, never point this toward your face. Assume it's loaded and charged. Um, so I'm gonna pull this end cap off whenever, I, right before I get ready to load it uh, or put the hose to it. I just pull up on the little clamp, uh, the release catch. I'm on, and then it rocks back. And then from there. I can simply, it was empty. I must have used them all the other night. Oh. So again, these go in upside down. The other nailer loaded from the top on a rail. These load inside. So again, I just pull up on my handle a little bit and it locks in place. 
from now I'll go ahead and connect my um, I got one of those wedges down on the ground um, I'll go ahead and connect my air hose again pointing that away from my face and it's all set um, so again I center my screen on my holes and then I'm going to tack it in and if you get the wire sticking up like this in the corner you just bend it over a little bit to pop it down again just make sure it's covered on all sides and I'll go ahead and nail it and again I like earplugs in because it gets loud and for whatever reason oh it's got a safety on it and then I just roll it over go to the next one again keep my hands out so again I'll push it forward and I'll get this corner Same thing now, come down the side, and then I like go through the center and get about three in there, go there, and now it's just a matter of, I'll close my gates so they're out of my way now. Usually you're not dealing with equipment that has gates, um, but anyway, so now I'll just start stapling in place. In place, it's going to stick up and get my hands as I'm messing with the bees, I'm making sure it's stapled down enough where the bees can't come through. And what this is doing is keeping the purpose of the snail grub board, it keeps them, the bees from uh, passing the queen pheromones from one section to the other. Just that easy. Sticking up, I'll nail it. And what I've seen some people do, if they're worried about nailing their hands with this, they'll come back and put a one eighth inch tall or one sixteenth inch, excuse me, one, yeah, it is one eighth, one eighth inch tall uh, piece of wood uh, sheathing around this just to protect their hands from getting right on top of the wire. Um, I don't worry about it. I'm just going to be careful uh, when I go into it. I'm not sticking my hands in and getting nailed by these edges of the wire. Again, centering the wire, make sure it's centered. Open my gates just to make sure my gates aren't, aren't going to be interfered with it. <coughs> They're not, so I can close them up now. All right, so I got plenty of room to work with. Nail, nail and center. Nailed, 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 nailed. Push flat, flat, flat. Out of nails. I'll disconnect it, proper way to do it. Proper way is to disconnect it like I did like there. I saw I was firing blanks. Um, so proper way is to disconnect it from the air source, which I did. Connect. Gremlins on me tonight. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Safety's off. All right, so that's all there is to building a Snellgrove board. Again, remember Snellgrove said uh, any hole three and a half inches in uh, diameter or larger works. Um, so it's been a fun little project. Again, I'll have photos of the tools that I use, typically use in all my projects. Um, it's a fun little project, and thank you for watching.